We are Gold Ivy, a health company dedicated to simplifying health and wellness. Tune in as we search to find the deep, real, and raw truth. We're here to talk big, no room for small talk. It is our mission to inspire, seek growth, simplify the action steps, and build confidence. You decide what works for your daily life and how to transform our lessons into your gold. Are you ready to step into your power? Now is the time. Join us on the fearless pursuit of self-discovery and growth. This is Ivy Unleashed, a Gold Ivy production. It has never been easier to make the switch to solar. With Everline Solar, you simply take the money you already spend to rent power the old way and shift it over to pay for solar panels you own instead. We're helping thousands of homeowners go solar every year and growing fast. So we're hiring awesome people for all positions, including the industry's best summer and year-round sales program, as well as flexible work-from-home jobs. View open roles and apply today at EverlightSolar.com. If you're a regular listener of the show or you follow us on social media, you know I, Brooke, just ran my first marathon and Andrew ran her 22nd state and her goal to run a marathon in every state. How did I go from barely getting out of bed to being able to run 26.2 miles, a customized training plan, and coaching with Andrea? With my health concerns, it was important for me to make sure I crossed that finish line safely and confidently. We are so excited to announce that we are now offering customized training plans. Whether you're wanting to run a 5K, 10K, half, or full marathon, we've got you covered. Get your customized training plan plus coaching to get you race ready and keep you motivated along the way. Prior to receiving your training plan, you will meet with me, Andrea, for a 15 minute call to discuss your goals, race details, and schedule your three coaching calls. You will receive a training plan for your race, tailored to your schedule, endurance, and cross training preferences like yoga, biking, strength, or whatever movement you enjoy. Coaching throughout your training will provide accountability, safety, and inspiration to keep you pursuing your training and race goals. With Andrea, you will connect your mind and body to maximize your race experience. And if you're looking for a custom training plan without coaching, we're offering that as well. Head over to the shop page on our website, goldivyhealthco.com, to learn more and get you across that finish line. Welcome back to Ivy Unleashed. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I am really excited about this episode because I have no idea uh, about anything and I have so many questions for our awesome guests today. So first of all, we want to welcome our first naturopathic doctor, Dr. Daniel Vogler-Boss. Hi there. So nice to see everyone and your beautiful faces. Oh, you're so sweet. We are so happy you're here and we're finally diving into this topic because Andrea knows a little bit about naturopathic medicine just from my experience. And, you know, there's a lot of confusion. I think now people are hearing naturopathic functional alternative. And so, although I am totally on board with what you do, I think we should take a step back and (laughs) hear exactly what being a naturopathic doctor means. That's a really great question because I completely understand from a patient's perspective how confusing the terms are. I mean, absolutely. There's holistic, there's integrative, there's functional, there's naturopathic. Like, what does that mean? And I would say like the big word that's being thrown around today is functional medicine. And it's a way and way that a doctor actually practices meaning that we're diving deeper into like biochemical pathways and microbiome aspect, just going a little bit step further. And traditionally, that's what naturopathic doctors have always done. I would say the more popular term is functional medicine, but naturopathic doctors have always practiced that way. But nowadays, medical doctors can practice functionally if they wish to go get more education around that. And same with um, DOs. So they can also practice functionally if they wish. Integrative is more about using, I would call it more tools in your toolbox. So you can understand the conventional side of medicine, but you can also tie in more of those alternative treatments like botanical medicines and nutraceuticals and diet and lifestyle, things like that as well. So hopefully that cleared that up a little bit, but I would say that I practice integratively. I'm a naturopathic doctor and traditionally I treat functionally. 
I hope that helps to understand the like the the compounding of all that. I have 34 questions just from that right there. <laughs> No, so what I'm curious about then, so, I mean, it sounds to me like you do it all then. It means, to me, you look at it from every angle is kind of what I'm hearing and have a, a lot of, give you a lot of tools for your toolkit for yeah. how to take care of yourself. I, I can't do it all. I will, um, when I'm working with people, I definitely tell them where I feel most comfortable working in their realm. And I say this because I may be able to look at it from a, a, a different angle and be able to look at it from a whole person perspective, but knowing conventional, like we may need imaging or we may need like an endocrinologist on the board or something that like, I would want another expert opinion in that manner. So I think from my lens is that I'm able to pull all the different angles together that a patient might be experiencing and help them navigate both the conventional side and what we need there, but also bringing in like the botanicals and the lifestyle and the diet and things that are also very important that they may not have when they're meeting with conventional doctors. They don't always have the time to spend 30 to 90 minutes to dive into that. And so that's where our sweet spot, I would say, comes into play. Yeah, it's almost like you're filling that gap between Western and Eastern medicine because it is, yeah. it's a team effort. And from my experience, it was you get thrown around from GI doctor to OB to all these different types of specialties. When I was like, I really just want, I need a team here. <laughs> yeah. So we can't fulfill all the roles, but I think it really helps people understand when we have conversations about, okay, this is what we're doing and why, and what kind of information we can gather, but this are some other options for you in treatment. Yeah. So what type of patients do you typically see then? You know, traditionally I see women, I would say I'm open to treating men, but traditionally women are just more open to medicine. I would say I love working with my 20 year olds, my 30 year olds, but I also love working with perimenopausal women. So forties, fifties, and even older. So kind of through the different ages and oftentimes in realm for gut health and hormones. So I would say I'm a gut and hormone expert. Yeah. And if you know me, now you understand why Dr. Danielle is here. Yeah. Because <laughs> we are so excited to dive into hormones and gut health and how they are so interconnected. But more so, we're going to take this episode to really discuss hormones at each levels. We recognize that our audience, we have exactly what Dr. Danielle just said. We have the 20s, the 30s, the perimenopause. And so what is it that we need to know about hormones to run our life and not have these hormones that are raging run us? <laughs> Great question. Yeah. I, I love this topic because I think it really helps for people to understand like why hormones are so important. So I'm going to take it a step back and say like there are three major groups of hormones that we're dealing with. We have our premenopausal phase. So younger women cycling, they have an actual period. So there is that kind of phase. And then there's perimenopause, which is they may have a cycle, but we're starting to head towards menopause. And then menopause is actually not having a period for 12 months. That's kind of like where that comes into play. And that transition through those hormones can be different for every individual, but those are actual kind of like big groups in which hormones are kind of going through. And they're not diagnoses or diseases. This is like a natural progression that we have. Another piece that we know is that we're most vibrant for hormones are at the top of the 20s and already they're starting to head downhill. They're starting to decrease. And it's kind of crazy to think that, but it's partly because as women, we are born with all the eggs we're ever going to get. And that actually influences our menstrual cycle and how many we will have and then how we transition into menopause. So there's all of that kind of understanding. And I wanted to outline that because I think it does get confusing about menopause sounds like almost like a disease, right? Like all the symptoms that we associate with it. And then pre-menopause is also confused with being in that phase where we're getting hot flashes and vaginal dryness, all that kind of stuff. So I just wanted to outline pre-menopause, peri, and then post. And then another thing that's really cool to like take a step back is we always talk about hormones, hormones, we kind of like throw that word around. But I wanted to take a step back and tell you that like hormones are our communication system. So our body basically has two communication systems. We have the brain with our nervous system and I always think of it as like, kind of like a light switch. That's kind of how that runs, that kind of system. It's very immediate. 
you know exactly what you're turning on and who you're talking to. And that's kind of how the brain and the nervous system works. So that's really great for like, say when you touch something that's really hot, you're burning your finger. You're not burning your entire body. That That's why that system is very important to us. It's like life-saving to a degree. Where hormones, they work different. They work like your thermostat in your home that's keeping control of your like air conditioning and your heating. Hormones are always cyclically being released um, night and day. They're kind of like pulsatile. And they're really important because it runs the entire house or your entire body. And that's really important to understand that because when I get a lot of women or men coming in saying, I have a lot of different symptoms, it doesn't make sense. Well, it's because our hormones touch a lot of different systems in our body. That's kind of the differences. But the difference in the like the hormone phase is that we like have four or five different thermostats in our body, which is why it makes it so kind of confusing for people to take a step back from it is, is because there's multiple systems that are trying to keep this kind of balance. And so we have basically four subtype of hormones, adrenals, which would be like your DHA and your cortisol, your thyroid hormone, which is T3 and T4, your sex hormones, which would be estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone, and then your gut hormones, such as insulin. So you can see there's a lot of communication going on and they are all very interconnected. So that's why hormones is such a big topic because there's so many things that are getting involved or playing a role in that. Oh, I'm so glad you broke it down like that because no one teaches you that. Mm-hmm. You hear all these words, but unless you go through something where your hormones are imbalanced or you're doing these things to get them, quote unquote, in balance, like you don't know. You just feel some type of way that you know isn't right. right. <laughs> and is it just because I'm a woman or is something really wrong? So I'm curious what these symptoms if something is really out of balance, like what are some symptoms that you see? What is normal and what isn't normal? Yeah. So um, I'll kind of break it down into two categories. I would say that, you know, a lot of times younger women are complaining about like pelvic cramping during their period or low back pain, breast tenderness, maybe heavy bleeding, things like that. Although it's common, I would not deem that normal. So those are some symptoms. You could have menstrual migraines or acne, things like that. And those are all signs that potentially hormones are not balanced and that other things need to be addressed. Even though it may not be emergent, it might be for quality of life purposes, right? Also think about in those years where um, you could think about women wanting to get pregnant. So if you're under 35, and you've been trying for 12 months, like that would be a fertility piece and maybe hormones are playing a role there, right? Um, If you're over 35, it would be gonna be, it's gonna be about six months of trying if you haven't conceived and that could also be a presentation there. So I would say those are kind of like in your menstrual cycle years, some symptoms that might be progressing. Now for perimenopause and menopause, we start to see classic menopausal symptoms like hot flashes, vaginal dryness, night sweats, um, low libido, maybe that's causing some pain with sex from it, brain fog, insomnia, things of that nature. And that perimenopause, that transitional phase, you can honestly have a little bit of both because you're not fully without a period yet. So you're having PMS symptoms, but you can also start having the those meta, classic menopausal symptoms peak in because your hormones are d- starting to decrease. So those are some things that, sure, we, we call them Um, common that, you know, they're out there. You'll hear a lot of women complain about them, but just because that's the case doesn't mean that it should be dismissed. Yes, exactly. I think it's so important to hear what you see and, and what's common, but also knowing like this could be something that we address. And so what I'm so curious about is how, like how you limit those imbalances. Like what can we do to kind of now, I'm scared of the hot flashes. I'm already, I'm sweating right now. Like, and I'm only 36, so I'm nervous. I'm so glad you're doing this first. Yes. <laughs> so I want to know, like, what can we do? How can we help ourselves out and, and limit these imbalances that can potentially happen? If you struggle with digestion, energy, bloat, acne, mood, fatigue, listen up. I spent four years, 50 plus doctors, and tens of thousands of dollars to heal my gut so you don't have to. 
I've created the what to do guide I wish I had before spending years navigating the overwhelming amount of information and conflicting doctors' opinions out in the gut health world. My help, I can't figure out what's wrong with me. The How to Heal Your Gut Starter Kit is now available and the response to it online has been incredible. On top of what I wish I would have known, I also wish this information would have been easily accessible for me. Because of that, it's available to you on the shop page of our website for only $9.99. Included in my guide is what helped me and countless others heal their gut, along with chronic fatigue, acne, hormone imbalances, and so much more. You'll learn what foods to stay away from, what foods to eat, a four-week gut healing eating plan, lifestyle tools to aid your healing process, and two of my go-to favorite recipes. So head over to our shop page on our website, goldivyhealthco.com. And remember, happy gut, happy life. You can heal. Let me help you. I cannot stress to you enough about um, for long-term success lifestyle. Although not everyone is going to be able to fix necessarily issues just on lifestyle, it is something that I always encourage for long-term success because that is the foundation, right? And so that would be like our pillars, like getting good sunshine, having sleep routines um, in play. You're getting good quality sleep, thinking about what you're eating. Are you staying hydrated? And how's your mental health? Because that absolutely plays a role too. Like, are we taking in so much stress? Are we, are we worrying about our mental health? So think about what you're doing on a day-to-day basis. And I know there's a lot of us that tell ourselves like, I know I need to get good sleep. I know I need to eat healthy. I know. What I and I think for women, we maybe steer away from it when we can't be a hundred percent involved. Like when we can't do it a hundred percent degree, have you ever like been in that scenario where you're like, I don't want to work out today. Cause like, I can't be a hundred percent there for the full 60 minutes or something. So you just don't do it. Right. Mm Right. I think some of us hold us back because we want to be perfect in making changes for our health routine, but it's little, it's really about just making little snapshots where you can't. So maybe that I, and maybe you've taught this too, because you guys are, you know, coaching about um, exercise and stuff, but maybe you've told him like, do 15 minutes when you can go on your lunch break or absolutely in the morning. Right. Yeah. So, I grew up, I grew up on fast food, didn't know how to cook. And so, um, it took me a long time to start making implementation and get my taste buds back into like wanting fruits and vegetables and real food. Right. So for me, it was like, what can I do at home? That's simple. You don't have to make it so over the top. You don't need to like get a cookbook that has like 20 ingredients to have a meal. Like you could literally have a good protein source and a veggie side and a fruit side. You don't have to think over the top to be healthy. And I do think that medications and supplements do play an important role. But I, at the same time, I'm always trying to be an advocate for still thinking about those pillars of health Mm -hmm. and where you can fit those into your day. Yeah. Like, you know, they say you can't outrun a poor diet. I also think the same thing with supplementation. And for my journey, it was like, I just want this pill. I want to find the quick pill. And we're finding that with everything we post on social media, that people, they want quick and easy, which I totally get. get So I'm curious if people are, you just want it to be gone. Yes. Yeah. Are there certain supplements that you do recommend or certain things that people could get through food, different vitamins? What's kind of your approach I definitely like to assess where patients are for nutrients. I feel like that helps me to navigate a little bit more. So if you're one of someone listening, like I do encourage seeing if you can get some of that evaluation, but some basics, like getting on a good multivitamin to kind of fill in those nutrient deficiencies where you might not be getting in your day a hundred percent, that could be really helpful. If you're, you know, eating more vegetarian or vegan diet, maybe getting into kind of a vegan or vegetarian, like fish oil replacement, things of that nature. So that would be kind of additive for some people. Probiotic is a really nice thing. And then honestly being here in Minnesota, vitamin D. Mm-hmm. But I, I, I really do encourage patients to get assessed for vitamin D because vitamin D, although we call it a vitamin, it is a hormone. It acts like a hormone as well. And so there is a toxic load to it if you're taking the incorrect dosing structure. So I do think vitamin D is probably needed for a large population here 
being in the Midwest, but I do encourage getting assessment so you know exactly what you need there for that dose. How does one go about getting tested? Because I know the test that I had through my primary care was a lot different than the test I had through my functional doctor. Like it was yeah. a hair test that my boyfriend cut a chunk of my hair. Oh, really? You had a hair test. Okay. Interesting. Well, I do feel that like conventional medicine is being more on board with testing vitamin D. So I do think that like starting with a primary care, or your OB might be a great place uh, spe specifically for that particular test. It is a blood test. That would be the way that I would test vitamin D. You know, some people can't have the, can't get the labs done. It just depends on the practitioner. And so if we're feeling like we need more testing, using your functional doctor, naturopathic doctor is also really great. And then that way you can dive deeper into nutrients and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. And I love what you're saying too about finding it from food choices, right? Like shifting what's on your plate a bit and mm -hmm. something that Brooke and I are head over heels wrapped up into right now is gut health with <laughs> TikTok. Everybody wants more information from Brooke on what she's doing, how she's healed her gut. It's so important. And what we really want to get into is how gut health affects your hormones. And yes. just, I know that this is your jam. This is what you do. And so wherever yeah. you want to start with that, please tell us how the gut health affects our hormones. I can literally like spend probably all day talking about this. So I'm going to give a snapshot of it, but really highlight like what's a big piece when it comes to hormones. So our gut health, we always want to think about maybe just like one aspect to it, like maybe the stomach or the intestines, but it really comes down to a large group of organs. So we have our esophagus, our stomach, our large intestine, our small intestine. Um, we have our liver and gallbladder and pancreas. There's a lot of organs that are playing in what we call gut health. When you think about that and you think about the communication systems that we have with our gut health, we have the vagus system, which is why we can get gut feelings or when we, we feel like anxious, our stomach hurts. There's that kind of aspect to it. There's a, a large amount of blood supply there because when you're digesting foods, you need to absorb nutrients. And for that reason, if you have gut dysbiosis or increase um, permeability. A lot of people call it leaky gut. Um, that's probably like the layman's term that gets kind of thrown, thrown around. You can have things that might not supposed to be there get into your bloodstream. So I just kind of like more predispositions to like food sensitivities or nutrient deficiencies, things like that. At the end of the day, the biggest piece that I'm looking at for gut health when it comes to hormones is actually how we clear hormones so we know that estrogen metabolism, there's two phases at the liver. So we break down phase one, phase two at the liver, but the third one is actually at our gut. So you could have a really nice liver working through to break down estrogen for clearance, but if you have dysbiosis, meaning like your good healthy bacteria is diminished or you have an overgrowth of bad bacteria or yeast presentation or parasites or whatever that might be, what happens is when that estrogen is getting ready to get cleared out into the stool, if you have that dysbiosis there, it will get unpackaged. And it's no longer in the parent form of estradiol. So estradiol is like parent hormone. And so it'll come out in a different format that would be more of a metabolite. So I know there's a lot of words there, but essentially estrogen should be cleared out through the gut for the last phase. And if it's not going out, is getting unpackaged and then put back into the body. And that can create what we often associate with estrogen dominant symptoms. So that's a lot of times what people are complaining about, like, oh, I'm getting a lot of acne or I'm getting a lot of breast tenderness or cramping, things of that nature. It's potentially that we're not getting estrogen moving out in the right direction. And that third phase happens to be at the gut multifactorial as you can see right yeah i love how you explain it though it's so easy to understand that and makes so much sense just based on my experience and i'm sure a lot of women can attest to this you go into your ob and you explain like i have the worst cramps or my boobs hurt so bad okay let's get you tested for pregnancy let's do that oh no here just take this birth control so mm -hmm. are there other things than the pill that you know like what is your approach to that? Because what I've seen, and I'm sure a lot of women have, is just the pill being thrown at them. 
first off, you know, being on contraceptives, there's a lot of feelings around it. So I always tell patients before they make that decision is to really sit on it to understand why or what they want to do with their health. If if you are looking for a no-fail way to not get pregnant and you really find that the contraceptive of a birth control pill or an IUD makes sense for you, absolutely go that route because that's your goal you want to achieve, right? But for some people, that's not the goal that they want to achieve. Maybe they're wanting to get pregnant. Maybe they want to fill their own natural cycle. Maybe there's been imbalances on birth control and they would like to actually address the underlying cause then maybe birth control does not make sense. And so I do believe that there's other things that we can do to address depending on the situation. And generally speaking, it's looking at like, are you ovulating correctly? How is your hormones being produced? Are you making enough estrogen and progesterone and testosterone? Where are those levels lying? And also the way that we're clearing them. And that's a big component too. So you might run labs and say, Hey, hey, look, you got enough hormones there, but it's just as important to understand the clearance of hormones too. So that's how I approach it. If a, if a patient comes to me and says, look, I don't want to be on birth control, but I'm having a lot of these symptoms. What can we do? That's one aspect that I'll look at is like, how are we making hormones and how are we clearing them? So you said a blood test can show you kind of where those hormones are, how you're making them. What about how you're clearing them? How does one know that? That's a good question, and I'm glad you asked. So there are different ways of testing hormones, and although blood work is the most consistent, meaning most conventionally understood, there's like um, serum testing, blood tests, those show us your your parent hormones. So estradiol and progesterone and testosterone, things of that nature, and that helps me to understand where your hormones are at from a production standpoint. But if we're actually wanting to look at clearance, there's a urinary metabolite test. I specifically use Dutch. There's maybe some other ones out on the market, but it actually will show byproduct of um, those hormones in the urine. And that can help us understand how they're actually clearing. So even though we're looking at hormones on both tests, it's actually different angles. And that gives us different information. And depending on the scenario and how Uh, what kind of symptoms a person's feeling or where they're at with their hormones, one test make more sense than the other. And that would come down to like having an in-depth conversation to see what makes most sense. So what I'm picturing is like me going to the doctor once a year and Mm -hmm. having, you know, this is conventional medicine, me having a 10 minute conversation and I'm out of there and there's some solution. This sounds like I would need to come in there probably a few times throughout the month to see where I'm at in my different cycles to do these a blood test and a urine test. So what would you say for a timeline if you're trying to get the answers of production and clearance of your hormones, like how what's this process look like for like a timeline and how often we need to come in and see you? Yeah, that's definitely a good question. It definitely varies, I'll say that, because not every person is in the same circumstance. But generally speaking, what I often do with patients is have an initial intake, see what their goals are, see how their cycle is doing, and see if they're on birth control or not. If they're not on birth control, if they have a cycle, um, we'll try to figure out what a sweet spot is to get their labs drawn, because usually it's about five to seven days after they're ovulating. That's generally when I test. If they don't have a cycle, then we generally just go on any day. And that's because we don't see that cycle happening. And then we'll wait for labs to come back. Generally, I will do blood work first to see where things are at. But again, this is very dependent on um, each person. When we review them, I try to go through a lot of details. So that would be the second appointment, spending time for a lab review and seeing what we're seeing on paper and also pairing it up with what they're telling me. Both are super important. I would say that like the in-depth conversation gives a lot of valuable information and getting blood work does too. So I like to see both. And that's where identifying like on that um, second appointment helps us to kind of figure out what their plan looks like. Hormones do take time. It's not a quick fix. The way that we're ovulating is usually about three, three months ahead of schedule essentially. And so Generally speaking, I'll say like three months minimum is where we need to help start seeing changes in hormones. And, and really that's dependent. Like if it's on clearance, maybe it will be shorter. But if we're trying to change an ovulation cycle or something like that, it can take a little bit more time. So it just depends on person to person. 
I know some um, people have talked about like PCOS or endometriosis. Those conditions definitely take more time. I know it's not black and white, but that would be, you know, generally speaking, I will say three to six months is generally where like we might see some shifts. And then if we're having more challenges, it can take a year or more. It just depends on the person. So if you get this blood work back and the clearance is not so hot, is it then medication that they're prescribed in addition to these lifestyle changes? Or what does that next step look like from there? Not always. I would say there's a lot of herbals. If you're, if you have a good understanding of how herbal um, medication or herbals and nutrients, should I say, if you understand those and where they are working in the hormone pathways, a lot of people respond really well to those types of therapies without having to do medication. Okay. So when you say botanicals, what do you specifically mean by that? So botanicals are often thought as plant medicine. And that's been around for a really, really long time. In fact, some of the prescriptions that we have on the market today were coming from the understanding of what plants do for our body. And so um, some plants have like immune modulation um, actions or they helped the adrenals adapt or maybe they work on reducing inflammation. There's just many actions out there that plants have. And it's really been in medicine for some time and that's why it's been unfolding. It's, it's, it's such powerful medicine. And so oftentimes it'll be in like capsules, like in um, supplements that you would take and some are often in tinctures. It just depends on what the patient needs. I like, love hopefully that, that helps. Mm -hmm. There's so many things out there. Yeah. yeah. Well, when you think of naturopathic medicine, right? Like using the healing powers of nature, just like the vitamin D and even like social connection, I think it's a very natural way versus putting medicine in your body that you don't really know the effects of it. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. yeah. that can be scary. And, and people might know about some of them. I mean, I feel like a lot of people are on like turmeric or curcumin. They've tried that in their cooking, right? Or mushrooms, um, lemon balm or chamomile. Um, a lot of people have heard those things on the market. One um, particular herb that I will often use is Vitex or Chase Tree. Some people actually have heard about that because it's starting to come out on, on shelves that we would see maybe at Walgreens or something. So there's just so many different actions and so many different things that really have helped to create even prescriptions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's kind of going back to the kind of the root, the real, the live action of that plant rather than making it synthetic. You mentioned PCOS and endometriosis earlier. And yeah. I know a lot of people are prescribed medication for that. And same with like hypothyroidism. Do you believe that there's a natural approach to curing that or dealing with the symptoms of, of these conditions? It really does come down to the severity, but I do see a lot of people get a lot of great success out of using tools to help support their body in the right manner. And um, PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, it's a syndrome and there can be different reasons for having that. And from my approach, we're able to test and understand the hormones and um, the cause and maybe what's triggering it, whether it be blood sugar or adrenals or testosterone just driving really high. I mean, there's a lot of reasons for it. But I do find that when we're able to dig a little deeper, a patient will get better success um, with moving forward with treatment. Same with endometriosis. You know, it does depend on the severity. And oftentimes it's diagnosed and treated through laparoscopic surgery, but for like quality of life and moving forward, it can be really helpful of learning about tools that they can do long-term at home to reduce um, either return or help reduce symptoms. So I do see a lot of pe people that find a lot of benefit in the medicine that we're doing. Mm -hmm. So, and same with thyroid. I know you talked about thyroid. I work with thyroid patients as well. And whether hypo or hyper, you know, they may need medication to help with it. But again, helping support the body where it needs. I've had some people go into what we see as remission, where they like may not need to use that medication anymore or just be on a much lower dose than what they would have had to have been without it. Yeah. I'm thinking of too, just like, hypertension, like high blood pressure, right? Just because you've been diagnosed with high blood pressure doesn't mean there isn't things you can do in your life to make it better, to improve the health mm -hmm. of your cardiovascular system. So now I'm thinking about that with my hormones. Like 
what can I do in my lifestyle? What can I eat? What can I drink? What can I do to help my hormones balance out? And so do you have some of those just like tangible tips for people? Like what can we do day to day, eat, drink, do that will help with this? Yeah. I think for me, I don't like to think of everything as an elimination. I know a lot of us like want to cut large groups of food out of our diet. And although that can be medically necessary for some people, I'd say the bigger thing that I like to look at is fiber, 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 fiber. We can talk about a little bit more later on, but fiber is so important for our gut health because fiber is needed for the good, healthy bacteria to feed on it and create short chain fatty acids, which is needed for like creating a hospitable environment. So keeping more good, healthy bacteria alive. It helps with blood sugar, so it reduces blood sugar spiking, and that can help many different things um, for that reason. I mean, blood sugar dysregulation is a big problem nowadays with metabolic disorders such as diabetes, and uh, fiber is also really good at moving cholesterol and our hormones as well, because our hormones are steroids, they're um, fat soluble, and so they actually move out often in the stool. And so fiber is really needed for good, healthy bowel movements and moving those out. So like the standard American diet, I think the research has shown that generally we only get like 10 to 15 grams of fiber in an entire day. And generally speaking, we would want to try to get that with each meal. So you can see like how much a detriment we're doing to our hormones if we're not getting enough fiber. Yeah. Can you give just like a few examples of some easy, high fiber, heavy hitters that people could try and... Sprinkle into their day? Yeah. Yeah. So there's a large category of them. You know, there's your nuts and seeds. And I think those are great for people that need to like carry something with them in their car, like to snack on. I think that's a great way. A lot of people love to do smoothies or acai bowls now, and you can throw in like flax seeds or chia seeds or hemp seeds. And that's very um, easy. Beans, beans are really high in fiber as well as our fruits and vegetables. So, I mean, those are things that we're always kind of talking about, like tasting the rainbow and stuff. I think the seeds are fun to kind of add in because you don't need like large quantities of them to get a good amount of fiber. It's e- I think it's easy to implement for that reason. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like going back to the basics of what are you having for fruits and veggies? How many are you having throughout your day? And knowing too, like, with those, not only the fiber, you're going to get so many more nutrients and vitamins from those foods. And so- Absolutely. I mean, I do like work with nutri deficiencies quite often. And sometimes we need to go beyond just food, but a lot of times we're just not getting nutrient dense foods to begin with. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's because our palate has changed. Like when you are going out to eat and eating a lot of processed food, they add a lot of sugar, they add a lot of salts and um, other seasonings and stuff that can be wasted calories because there's a lot of dressings and stuff like that. And our taste buds are changed. And so it can be hard to swing back for that reason. But even me, because I, like I said, I I grew up on fast food. That's, that's what I grew up on. My parents don't like to cook. They still don't like to cook. And so I had to just find things that I liked. And you can use restaurants to your advantage. I actually tell people sometimes, try something that would be healthy in a restaurant setting first so that you can be like, oh, it's safe. And then that way, when you go home, you're like, I'm gonna make that because I can't. I can can make something that might be healthier. Mm -hmm. So for example, I used to not like beans. So one time I went to a restaurant, they gave me a side of like a black bean dish that was more dressed up. And I tried it and I was like, oh my God, I actually really love these black beans. Like I'm gonna do this at home. And now I make that all the time when I'm like, you know, short on meals or whatever. I'm like, black beans, here we go, with some like sea salt. So. I know that's kind of a backwards thinking, but for some people that have been working on like a really processed type food for a long time and they are having a hard time switching, sometimes eating out and eating a healthier version of it at a restaurant and then trying it at home can actually be a great way to step back into getting a taste profile for just like nice fruits and vegetables and beans. Totally. I set goals with people all the time about uh, Wendy's has like awesome salads because they're like, I don't know how to make a salad. I don't know how to do this. It's like, Go to Wendy's. There's like five of them. Pick one or just look at the menu on any restaurant's website and be like, what's in the salad? And go buy those things and just try throwing Mm -hmm. it together and see if you can recreate it. 
so much healthier because you're like you're missing out on like the added things that they usually are doing right behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. but what you said about the nuts and seeds is powerful because it's what you can add in, right? A lot of us we think about restriction and it's scary and it's not fun, and then the brain's like ah. And so when you think about what you can add in, like Andrew and I add chia seeds to everything like it's so easy throw it in a smoothie hemp seeds flax seeds you know you you need to go to the bathroom add some flax seeds they'll do the trick (laughs) (laughs) and people are traveling you know Mm -hmm. i know we went through the whole pandemic but people are getting back on the road they're going back to work they're trying to like navigate like what that looks like in their lifestyle and i think that like having some of these healthy foods that are really easy to travel with are fantastic Yes. I'm curious about fermented foods, right? Because you can do fiber, right? We've got that covered. But then now there's like the kombucha and not now it's not new, but it's like if you start getting more into your health journey and you're thinking about gut health a little bit more, uh, there's so many things that you can try that can add the good bacteria. So how do you Mm -hmm. feel about adding fermented foods and can you kind of touch on the benefits of what they are and, and how they work? Love it. Yes. So I always think of like when it comes down to gut health, there are three main categories that we want to be adding into our regimen and fiber is one, but fermented is two and then inulin rich food is three. So the reason why fermented food is actually fantastic to add into your regimen is because it is actually your natural probiotic. So I know we talk about probiotics all the time, but Um, Fermented foods contain really healthy forms of lactobacillus and bifidobacteria generally when it's kept to the traditional sense of fermentation. And that's how we actually help to re-inoculate our intestinal lining with good, healthy probiotics. So I don't know about you, but I didn't grow up on fermented food. And I feel like although kombucha is becoming more popular, I do think it's been phased out of American food to a degree. And so doing your sauerkraut, doing your kimchi, your olives, Sourdough bread can also be a good one, but always do a caveat there that quality does matter. And same with kombucha, because it is such a hot, um, popular item nowadays. There are some companies that are making shortcuts on them by adding in poor quality probiotic. But in the traditional setup of fermentation for kombucha, it is actually a really healthy format to add into your regimen. And again, repopulation is that first piece. Fiber is creating that short chain fatty acid, which is needed for that hospitable environment. And then if you've ever heard the word prebiotic, when you're looking for probiotics, prebiotics are actually your inulin rich foods. So there's a lot of random foods, but like the top ones I can think of are like leeks, um, onion, um, bananas. Those are things that are actually rich in inulin, which is also kind of a food source for probiotic. So let me ask you this. Fermented foods, if you have overgrowth of bad bacteria, can fermented foods make it worse? Because I've been hearing mixed things. There are certain conditions in which you might notice when you eat those foods that you feel miserable. Mm -hmm. And generally, that might be a sign of an overgrowth of bacteria. And not to say that you couldn't do fermented foods down the road, but it might be a sign to look at your microbiome and see what's going on there. And so I wouldn't force fermentation or fermented foods um, in a person that might be feeling miserable. Obviously, we don't want that, but it definitely is ringing ding, 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 ding. Like maybe there's something there that we need to look at. As you were saying, like SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is becoming more common or more widely understood. And that's one of the conditions where there's an actual overgrowth um, bacteria or fungal infections that are in the small intestine that is causing bloating. And when you add more fermented foods or like broccoli or cauliflower, you feel miserable after. And so that's a whole nother process. So I do think you bring up a good point. This is not for everyone, but if you start to eat those high fiber foods and you feel really bad, further investigation should be warranted. Yeah, absolutely. Your body will tell you. And that was for me. I was eating all these healthy foods, but my body was like, you're feeding me garbage. I'm like, no, I'm not. So taking a step further and working with a functional practitioner who can help with gut health and get you on the specific herbs and routine to help because, you know, you can just throw probiotics and you think you're doing something good, but you're spending all these money, all this money on products that are just adding fuel to the fire. 
Right. So yes, I would agree. If you are taking a probiotic or you're doing, like I said, the probiotic rich foods with your fermentation and you're feeling worse and you're feeling more bloated and disgusted with those healthy foods, I would do more investigation because it could potentially be an overgrowth that you're actually dealing with. Okay. And let's talk about further investigation though, because yeah. I think if all you've done is Western medicine, it's like, how do I find, like, how do I know which physician to look for? Is my insurance going to cover it? You know, what would you suggest for people that are like, I want to go more of the naturopathic route or functional? Like, how do I get started mm -hmm. or how do I know who to find to do further investigation? Yeah. I know that's a tough one. So specifically for SIBO, not everyone is in agreement upon it. Even though there is quite a bit out there uh, showing that SIBO is a real condition and it does cause a lot of uh, symptoms, not every practitioner is willing to do the testing for it. Unfortunately, there can be some confusion on who to go to for that reason. I would say that traditionally more functionally practicing doctors, I think would be more widely accepted about doing the test, which is a particular breath test that assess your um, gas production in your breath. I would say like naturopathic doctors for sure are more open to it. So there is an association, uh, there's a Minnesota, Minnesota Association for Naturopathic Doctors that would help navigate maybe where there are naturopathic doctors in the area for our state. If you're not in the state of Minnesota, there is a association for America too. I'll give you the links for those. I feel like that would probably mm -hmm. be the best way to do that. Mm -hmm. But finding a naturopathic doctor is probably going to be your best bet. Otherwise, if you, um, I'm not sure if there is a portal for functional doctors. I'll have to look into that and see if that's another way to see, find your MDs or DOs that might do it as well. Yeah, just Googling two functional medicine pr practitioners in your area, yeah. ifm.org, instituteoffunctionalmedicine.org is a really great resource, but we'll link all that in our blog and in the show notes. So, yeah, that would be really mm -hmm. great. Yeah, you brought up something now. I'm like, yes, that, that's very true. So um, yeah, it's unfortunate at this time, it is kind of a complicated system to navigate, but I would say that your functional doctors are going to probably be more accepting of doing that particular test. Yes. And I will say this stuff can be very overwhelming and this is why I'm doing exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> and so if you are listening and you're like, I have this, I have that, like, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do. Pause right now. Take a deep breath. Mm -hmm. One step at a time. If your first step is messaging us on social media, if it's reaching out to Dr. Danielle, there is always help. There's always support. You're meant to thrive and feel good. And this episode, I hope you can see that there's a lot you can do to support yourself because it yeah. can be, and it is very overwhelming, but we can also look at it as there's a lot of things I can do to feel better. There's yeah. a lot of people out there that want to help you and that will listen to you because I know with Brooke's journey, that was a big part of physicians not taking time with her. And so I'm curious what that's like for you. You know, you talk about getting this big full picture and really hearing what your patients are saying and... What is that like knowing that there's physicians that give you eight minutes versus this full picture of really hearing patients? It does provide mixed emotions for sure. I think that from the heart of it, conventional doctors aren't really just trying to spend eight minutes with you, but I think that there is this insurance element that has started to control kind of the way that they have to practice. So it's unfortunate for that reason. So I do believe that many doctors do want to help get patients feeling better, but maybe the way that they were taught or the way that they're practicing from an insurance perspective doesn't allow for that. And so sometimes you have to take a step out of the health insurance model to be able to do more in-depth testing. And it's unfortunate, but it is where we're at in America with healthcare. So I think there's many factors into it. But I think generally speaking, doctors do want to help. It's just like, where, where are they at with everything? Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. We've had other practitioners on Ivy and Leash who have talked about, you know, if someone comes in for a headache and then they also talk about back pain, they have to bill for both. And it, it just gets so confusing to do the functional work and to bill an insurance. Yeah. So it's frustrating, but it makes sense kind of why it is the way it is. And that's, why I think taking advantage of all of the free resources online, finding different shows and podcasts to just learn more because then you can do what makes sense for your unique situation, whether it is right. finances and so on. 
Right, exactly. Yeah. So hopefully, I'm very optimistic that like America and our healthcare system will continue to grow. I think we have seen that with even states opening up licensure for naturopathic doctors because it is not licensed in every state. But I'm very hopeful that it will continue to kind of push for that because I feel like people are asking for that too. They're Mm -hmm. learning about it more and they're like, yes, I want to be heard. I want to have time and I want options for my health. And that's the biggest driving factor, Mm -hmm. you know, is us collaboratively wanting that, you know. I find it comforting with all that you're saying and all these tips that there's things that I can do that are in my control outside of testing or outside of even seeking out a practitioner at first. So yeah. that's, that's something that definitely gives me some comfort. Yeah, I think same with like gut health. And with my journey, it was going to bed at the same time every night or at least trying to, making sure I was getting enough sleep, getting sunlight in the morning. You know, like these routines are so powerful and how our brain thrives, our gut thrives. I'm curious, Dr. Danielle, is that the same with hormones? Absolutely. Um, I'm glad you brought this up because I was actually going to mention like how important routines are for our hormones. So kind of taking it back to, I told you our hormones are like a thermostat and how they're always kind of getting a message about where hormones are at and kind of releasing based on our need. And that is actually driven a lot by like rhythm. We like need this like rhythm in our life to kind of keep those hormones in the same manner. And so sleep and diet can actually play a big role in terms of keeping those rhythms. So maybe you've experienced like night shifts, or maybe you have a job where you don't um, work just days or just nights. You're kind of like in limbo. I know like a lot of nurses do that type of schedule, or maybe you've had struggled with insomnia for a really long time, whether that's hard time falling asleep or staying asleep, that can impact the way that our hormones are working. And so sleep hygiene is a big one like having a routine sleep, going to bed at the same time. You know, we always talk about like babies, like having a routine to get them down as children. So we're having like this routine with them. We need the same thing. And I think a lot of us, we kind of just live on a day to day, like going out to the bar, or maybe it's like working and keep working and keep working and keep working. And we just don't keep to a same routine or we're sitting there scrolling. I know that, you know, sometimes we're a bad habit of doing that. (laughs) So I think that like, a lot of us have been disconnected with this like nice sleep routine pattern. And I say that's a big component. And I try to encourage patients to find a healthy balance of going to bed earlier and getting that good quality sleep, because that's going to definitely impact the way that your hormones are being um, released from the brain. Another piece would be with diet, which I mentioned for a second. You've heard of like intermittent fasting or different fasting type things. I mean, that's been a big thing coming out, right? With diet. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. Every, you know, everyone's different with that, but I think we should touch topic on it because it's such a big fad now is to do some sort of fasting at some point. And there's a lot of great benefits, but I think for women who are busy and maybe do extreme fasting and then don't break a fast with healthy food or have enough food when you do eat, that also can impact the way that our hormones are being sent out because our hormones believe it or not, are made from cholesterol. So there, you know, if you're fasting for too long and you're not worrying about good, healthy food during the time that you are eating or you're not eating enough or you're not eating a good routine of maybe a breakfast, lunch, and dinner scenario, it could be potential that you're negatively impacting your hormones. So I do encourage like maybe a person playing with that a little bit and seeing if they if they do resonate with eating a breakfast, breakfast, lunch, and dinner scenario and making sure they have good fats and proteins to kind of keep them feeling more stable throughout the day. Mm-hmm. Something I'm thinking about too is hormones and how they make you feel, like the mood swings, you know, a few days before your period and those types of things. And knowing that some things that could help you could be regular sleep or what you're eating. And sometimes you don't have a whole lot of control in that. Like you mentioned nurses and I'm thinking like, man, they can't just stop and eat or they can't fix that. They don't have these sleep schedules or new moms and their kids keep waking up. And it's so, I do think there's this component of grace knowing like we need to acknowledge our hormones and the fact that they do affect how we interact with the world and how we feel about ourselves or our moods like you know thinking about this lack of sleep and giving yourself some grace like 
Yeah. You know, I think it's knowledge is important, right? The more that we know about our hormones and the things that we do have control over and we can make some shifts, but then also being like, yeah. okay, I'm in a tough phase of life right now too, yeah. knowing like, what, what can I do to yeah. help myself out a bit here? I think grace is actually a big thing. I think a lot of us beat ourselves up over things that we may not have control in our life. And that is stress and stress negatively impacts the body too. And you might be in a phase where you don't have control over that. And there's no harm in that to know that that's the phase that you're in, especially if like you're a mom or maybe you are working a different shift than you normally would or whatever that might be. I mean, it's not always perfect, but even if you're a night shift nurse or working nights or whatever, still trying to find some sort of routine that you can find within that. Mm -hmm. So still finding a time that you would consider your wake up time and your night time and finding when that would be your meals when you're able to. I think smoothies are great for nurses that are probably on the run. That way they can have a cup with them at their desk. That would probably be a nice solution for when you really can't sit down. But I think grace is a big component to that as well, because stress is a huge component in our today in general. I mean, you just can't avoid it. And that, we're not really trying to avoid it. We're just trying to you know, find those uh, moments where we can do what we can do and let the rest kind of roll off us, right? Kind of just like let it go. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, and I just, I love that you're giving so many tips of things you can do, right? Like thinking of there's different alternatives. There's, we can use the power of plants and, you know, maybe you're not getting great sleep, but you're going to have to eat at some point. So what can I eat? What can I pack in my car? What can I have if I'm working a night shift? I, I love all the tips that you gave because I think that they can, they can make, a big impact over time. Like you said, if you just think about little things you can do, even if you are in that tough phase of life, how can mm -hmm. I help myself out a little bit? I call it the snowball effect. If you can do a little bit where you can, it will help to maintain a feeling of feeling better. And when you have that time to do more, it will continue to compound at each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. You, you get that momentum and that energy, and then it's easier to do other things. Yeah. Exactly. Health is not a linear line as much as we want it to be. Um, I, I would say I never feel that health is linear either. It's going to be a journey. And so you just have to find that space of where you're at at that time. Yeah. Meeting yourself where you're at. I love that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I just really hope that it helps um, people know that there are some other options for their care. And, you know, if you have been working through things and it hasn't been working out on your health, maybe it's time to look at it from a different angle. And um, I know, like I said, we kind of talked about how naturopathic medicine and those different terms can get really confusing, but just know that there's other options out there and naturopathic doctors are a great place to start. We're, we're out here in the community and maybe you haven't heard it, but I'd say type it away. and You'll probably find some in your area for sure. Yeah. You're awesome on social media. Where can people find you? Um, they can find me on my own um, public Instagram page, which is dr.danielle.nd. So dr.danielle.nd. And um, I also have my work, we have a uh, work Instagram page as well, um, which I'll have you, I'll give that link to you as well. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. We'll share everything in our show notes and in our blog. Well, yeah. wonderful. Well, now we're excited to hear more from you with your three gold stars. Would you like to share those? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I was thinking about this and I know we kind of touched topic on it, but this is going to come off a little bit uh, out of left field, but pooping is mandatory. So I kind of talked about a little bit about how gut health is so important for hormones. And if you are not going at least one to three times daily, like feeling that easy to pass stool, that's something that I really encourage working on, which leads me to my second gold star which is really making sure that we're getting fiber rich foods into our diet. Like I said, a lot of us are deficient in getting good fiber rich foods. And so rather than thinking about uh, elimination or this like restrictive mentality, I actually think about like what foods in your diet are supporting that fiber. And I think that's because it can help with the blood sugar regulation, the cholesterol movement, the way your hormones are. And of course, about your microbiome. So those are two big ones for me. And then the third one we kind of touched topic on, but that would be boundaries. 
Um, I don't about know about you, but I feel like as women, we love to give ourselves and be helpful and really probably push our schedules like beyond what we absolutely can do, um, whether that be work, family, or friends. And I think we fill ourselves with so much that we forget what we need and boundaries are super important to create. So that might be saying no, that might be creating, you know, a start and stop time. If we're working at home still, you know, oftentimes we'll want to work into the night because we can. Maybe that's um, telling people what you need from them. Like, hey, you know, tell me a week in advance. I really need to know this before I can give you an answer. I don't know what that might be, but boundaries is a big piece for me. And I think I, I, I just see it in so many women just feeling kind of wasted away and forgetting the concept. I always come back to this. You know, when you're on an airplane and they're like, put on your own oxygen mask before you put on someone else's oxygen mask. This is the same way about health. And I think we should put our own oxygen mask on first and kind of focus on our health because when we are able to be the best version of ourselves, we can help someone else be the best version of themselves. So Beautiful. Oh. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Well, it's so important. I mean, you see so many women and I love that that's one of your three gold stars because sometimes it's like you'd think they'd be about just food and, you know, and sleep. But in reality, I bet that underlying factor is you got to care for yourself too. You got to oh, yeah. take care of yeah. you. Yeah. And I try to live it. I, I try to do that because I really do want to be here for the people that are sitting in front of me. And um, obviously life is a journey, like we said, grace, but I do think that boundaries are so important because we, we do give ourselves as women. We, we want to help everyone. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we have some more questions for you. We have yeah. our segment called Unleashing Ivy. So these are our three rapid fire questions. Are you ready, Dr. Danielle? Fire away. All right. My question has to do with hormonal acne because your girl's dealing with it right now. And I know a lot of people are on their period. They get it or they get it right around the chin and the jawline and they do the research and it says hormonal acne. So I'm curious what tips you have for that specifically. Okay. So we may not like this tip, but I do think this is going to be the easiest way to address acne. And that would be test not guess. <laughs> I know, I know that normally we'd want to take, do takeaways that you might want to do at home, but this, hear me out. This is the reason why I say this is acne is prevalent because our skin is our detoxification organ and acne is one way of showing that detoxification at the surface. And it can be for so many different reasons. So when a person comes to me for acne, I might draw out like a little circle, like that looks like a pizza with like all the slices. And I will say, look, acne can be from stress. It can be from too much testosterone. It can be from too much estrogen. It can be from like food sensitivities, our gut health, you name it. There's like so many different reasons for it. And so by me being able to hear out your story and your journey with acne, and then be able to identify what makes sense to test actually helps us to understand the root cause better and get to like clearer skin faster. Cause acne can take a really long time. And I, I think I just went on and said, you know, on a, another post for my Instagram and said, Hey, look, you know, you may have had great success with a medication, but as soon as you took it away, your acne all came back. We're, we didn't work on the root cause of it then. Right. It, it's just that it was being managed. So I know that generally I would love to have like a takeaway, but I think out of frustration, I've seen so many women be like, this acne has just got to go. And it's so irritable and, um, or irritating, should I say. And so I think that testing and hearing the acne journey is actually going to be better. Yeah. You know? And those tests, what you mean by those tests are the hormone tests, the gut health tests for different bacteria and, and things like that. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's where like having the intake and understanding what they're seeing, like maybe a time of cycle or is it always prevalent? Is acne like beyond just the face? Is it deep or surface level? Are they seeing acne get better at certain times or worse at certain times? Things like that can actually like lead me into, okay, what am I seeing here? Like, is it seeming more gut? Is it hormones? Is it seeming to be like overlapping to a degree? And I think that just allows us to approach it in a more personalized fashion. I like it. Love it. 
All right. My question is about you and how you grew up in America, right? And you grew up in the society and how you got to this place of being a naturopathic doctor. It's, it's a very alternative route. And so I'm curious uh, what inspired you to become one and what's your favorite thing about being a naturopathic doctor? My favorite thing. Okay. Remind me of that because <laughs> I might forget it. But, okay. Um, my journey, I think is threefold. Honestly, my aunt and uncle are doctors a pediatrician and an internal medicine doctor. And when I was young, they would bring me like the gloves and the caps and stuff. So I feel like already at a young age, I was like already kind of getting acquainted to medicine and really like made me inspired to go that route. But my second factor that plays a huge role and is more personalized to me is that my mom suffered from migraines. And at the time I lived in Indiana, that's where I was born and raised. And she saw many doctors, many conventional doctors, was able to meet with Mayo Clinic. And although we are very appreciative of the medicine to help diminish the pain because she was having migraines quite frequently, um, it wasn't until I actually moved up here that I started to learn about naturopathic medicine and other alternative medicine. And I was able to see my mom start to understand what were some of her triggers and some of her causes for migraines. And that was really eye-opening to me because I'm talking like I'm a young child at this point when she started to suffer from them. And I remember like people coming to the home and her being really ill and she needing to sleep in and stuff. And it's just, I was really close with her and to see that she was unwell, well, like it, it just, it's really painful, right? Mm -hmm. So then the third aspect that really drove me to naturopathic medicine was I actually went to Gustavus here for my undergraduate degree and they do J-terms which allow us to kind of go outside the conventional classes and do something that would help move us forward in our journey. And so I did have the opportunity to shadow um, different doctors, but also the Stillwater Hospital. And I got to see all the different like areas of medicine. And, you know, here in the back of my mind, I'm already seeing like my mom's journey with alternative medicine. And then I come across a nurse that been had been practicing for many years that actually decided to leave, stop practicing as a nurse in the oncology unit and came back to do energy medicine for patients receiving chemotherapy. So even though I don't do energy medicine, it really just made me like resonate with like there are other therapies out there that can really help provide relief or symptom management or better quality of life going through that health journey. So I think it was multifactorial. And what's your favorite part? I don't know. I think it's just like really fun. I kind of consider myself like an FBI agent <laughs> for health. So I feel like a little like undercover cop or something. And so it's, it's putting the puzzle pieces together. I think that's just like, I'm very creative. I, I think if I hadn't gone medicine, I would have gone like something art uh, fashion or, you know, I liked doing painting and stuff outside of that. And I think somehow that is creative to me. So yeah, I think it's the creative element for that. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, you're looking at the body as a system and the hormones and it's all interconnected. So you're totally right. FBI yeah. agent, detective. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just kind of joke about it, but I, I think that that's fun. It's like Medicine is not linear. It's not a one size fit all approach. And I think the creativity element does come to play in a naturopathic role because we're looking at biochemistry and we're looking at how people interact and uh, what resonates with them and how do we kind of work through all that. Yeah, I love it. All right. And my last question is what is one thing you wish you would have known sooner? Wow, that's a big question. <laughs> Let's see. What I would have known sooner? Hmm. I would say that, and now this is just for me. So this is, I'm not speaking to everyone because I told you that this is very personalized decision, but I wish I would have known the impact that birth control was going to affect for me. I think that would have been something because I went on it when I was in college for contraceptive purposes, but I also felt like I was kind of scared into it. And I wish I would have known that there was other options for me or how to approach that. Because I do think that that impacted my health journey to a degree. And that's not for everyone. So I don't want to fill that in. But I, I wish I would have known about other options when I was younger. Yeah. And I, I'm so glad you brought that up because there is other options. And we just scratched the surface of it. But I think yeah. it's important to know, like, you don't have to take it. 
there are other ways to do, you know, natural family planning and, and to think about how it's affecting you and just even investigating, investigating that is important to know that yeah. alone, just it's, knowing there's other options is important. Yeah. It's knowing your pros and cons and what you want to get out of it. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I didn't have any of that conversation. I was just scared into it. Mm-hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you for being with us today. Mm-hmm. This has been incredible. You've shared so many tips, so much gold. You are a wealth of knowledge and <laughs> we you. can't wait to have you back because clearly there's a million other topics we can yeah. <laughs> discuss. Yeah. I have really enjoyed spending time with you ladies. I really Good. appreciate you having me on here. So thank you as well. Well, yes. and I think it's, it's great to talk with someone that's really passionate about what they do. It's one thing, you know, a lot, right? That's a given. You're a very educated person, but you love what you do and you have compassion for people and it's exciting for you. I think you're definitely doing what you're supposed to do. So we're so grateful that you came with us to talk about Thanks. something you're so passionate about. Yeah. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Yes. And speaking of passion, we're passionate about words and words are gold <laughs> and we love quotes. So yeah. Dr. Danielle, would you like to leave us with your piece of gold? You know, I had to really think about this because I love a lot of quotes <laughs> and I feel like this maybe doesn't resonate with medicine per se, but it really resonates with me because I don't know about you, but I'm a Lady Gaga fan. Ooh, yes. Um, okay. Okay. I love the whole like born this way message. And although this is not her quote, it has resonated with me. And I feel like it kind of ties in. This quote is the privilege of a lifetime is being exactly who you are. This is Gold Ivy signing off. Listen to your <laughs> truth and go chase your gold. <laughs>